The Vermont Lottery has several plans in the future to keep their sales up, including adding instant ticket vending machines to stores and rest areas and promoting more of their electronic games, which in turn would raise more money for the state's education fund. Jared Richardson, News 7, Berlin. Crews will be taking away the burnt debris like these air ducts later this evening. Ryan says that all meals for the hospital are being prepared at a nearby nursing home. They hope to have the kitchen fully operational by next week. Jared Richardson, News 7, Woodsville, New Hampshire. Approximately two dozen families lived in this park around five years ago and about a fourth remained up until now. We tried to contact Kilburn Craigs about why they were evicting residents now, but they were unavailable for comment. Jared Richardson, News 7, Littleton, New Hampshire. Many of the Vermont lawmakers were glad that they could pass the new distracted driving law. All drivers will have to stop texting while driving by this summer. Jared Richardson, News 7, Lindenville. Chumlin ended his last full day of campaigning right here on Williston Road in South Burlington. It was one of his last chances to gain undecided voters. Fairpoint says that they have the resources and the income to carry out their promises to the state. They hope to have 100% high-speed internet access to at least 50% of their exchanges by the end of this year. Jared Richardson, News 7, South Burlington. Some Vermonters even travel all the way down to West Lebanon, New Hampshire, which is the shopping capital of the Upper Valley, to do their tax-free shopping. I'm Jared Richardson in Colchester, and coming up later on News 7, federal funding cuts could be coming soon to National Public Radio. See what that might mean for local public radio stations. And while Vermonters were out casting their ballots, the candidates were out using the final hours to push further last-minute votes. Gubernatorial candidate Peter Shumlin spent most of his day in Burlington. And News 7's Jared Richardson joins us live from Burlington. He's been following Shumlin throughout the day. In about an hour, hundreds of people will fill this ballroom to find out the results of the election. This year's most anticipated race is the race for governor. Democrat Peter Shumlin and Republican Brian Doobie are vying for the top spot. We got a chance to follow around Peter Shumlin yesterday on his last full day of campaigning. We have very few details about the situation that happened in Bradford this rainy afternoon, but here's what we know so far. Vermont State Police and the SWAT team showed up to an abandoned house on High Street in Bradford, which is about a half mile away from the downtown area. Witnesses told us that they showed up around the lunchtime hour and have been at the house all day. We talked to one state police officer and he briefly told us that a possible fugitive from the law was at the residence on High Street. The situation just ended around 5 o'clock, and they do have a fugitive in custody. Now a press conference is going to be held later this evening, and we'll be there and have a full update on tomorrow's newscast. For right now, reporting in Bradford, Jared Richardson, News 7. A long battle ended today for residents of a trailer park who have been fighting to keep their homes. A commercial developer bought the land that the trailers sit on, but did they give the residents enough time to find a new home? News 7's Jared Richardson reports. Fears became reality two weeks ago at the Tolls Trailer Park in Littleton, New Hampshire, after residents got a final eviction notice. I was mad, like, unbelievably mad, like, enraged. <laughs> it's going to be hard for me because we've always earned our money by how we uh, survive week to week and we were never prepared to move out. Last spring, the new owners of the park abruptly announced that they would be evicting everyone after they bought the park to commercially develop it. It's just, it's unreal what they can actually do to people, like, because I've paid rent just like everybody else to live here, so they can't, they shouldn't be able to just rip it down like they're doing, but I guess it's their land, they can do what they want with it. Residents of the park formed a cooperative when they first heard rumors that their homes might be sold back in 2004 to try and raise money to buy the land back. They couldn't, so they sued the retail developer who bought the land, Kilburn Craig's LLC, claiming they were obligated to relocate the park. Kilburn Craig's eventually won the case in early 2010. Nick Smith is a resident of the park, and he says he has no place to go. Living in a van. That's it trying to get a job. Kilburn Craig said two years ago that they have no immediate plans to develop the land. The thing is about money and there are those that are going to have to lose because of it. 
I don't like it. I don't think they should put it here. We don't need another store in this town. Mm. We got enough as it is. We're trying to make it like a city, but it's not going to work. Yeah. People who live in the area have their own opinions on the eviction of the residents in the trailer park. I think it's total bull for like 60 or days or six days. That's ridiculous. No way could someone move that fast. It's not fair for the, uh, to them. and I think they should have given more time to be able to look for more you know, places to live and stuff like that. In the end, Fillion says it's going to be hard to let go of the place he called home for around 30 years, but he says it's time to move on. I have no choice. I have to do the best I can. One step at a time, one day at a time. Approximately two dozen families lived in this park around five years ago, and about a fourth remained up until now. We tried to contact Kilburn Craigs about why they were evicting residents now, but they were unavailable for comment. Jared Richardson, News 7, Littleton, New Hampshire. The New Hampshire Community Loan Fund assisted many of the toll's residents on finding new homes. Cross-border shopping is a popular trend with Northeast Kingdom shoppers because of the close proximity of tax-free New Hampshire. But how does it affect Vermont businesses? News 7's Jared Richardson reports. Every day, many Vermonters make the short trip over to New Hampshire for one thing, tax-free shopping. Well, one of the biggest advantages is that all of our neighboring states are, uh, have sales tax and income tax, uh, which drives a lot of consumers to New Hampshire. New Hampshire does not have a sales tax, and that lures Vermonters to shop in the state. Chad Stearns, who is the executive director of the Littleton Chamber of Commerce, says that a lot of sales done at Littleton businesses are from Vermonters. We see a great deal of uh, Vermont license plates in New Hampshire and in Littleton every day. Vermont has a 6% sales tax, and that can make a difference on larger purchase items. Thank you, sir. Greg Koval of Just L Modern Antique says that he sees a good majority of shoppers from Vermont in his store. We do actually have a, a large Vermont trade that comes here and, uh, and have from the beginning. You know, let's say we're only a year and a half old, but uh, there's always been a, a large Vermont following. With Vermonters traveling over the border and spending their money in New Hampshire. Probably off the top of my head, it's probably easily 30 plus percent. It has a negative effect on Vermont border businesses. Well, I have to really keep my prices low so that it kind of equals what New Hampshire prices are. So I'm not able to make as much money on, a, on a, an item as somebody in New Hampshire could because they don't have to worry about that tar tax part of it. Some Vermonters even travel all the way down to West Lebanon, New Hampshire, which is the shopping capital of the Upper Valley, to do their tax-free shopping. In addition to Littleton, any border um, community is, is a great place to shop, such as West Lebanon. Koval says that in the down economy, consumers are trying to find any way to save money. If I look around town-wide, and particularly on a weekend, and I look at you know, the you know the box stores and the grocery stores and you know and you, you survey a parking lot you'll see a lot of Vermont cars and, and I think yeah I think um, where where the families are counting every penny uh, that little extra drive to New Hampshire I think they are doing it definitely. Glenda Hoffman of Copies and More in Wells River says that despite the sales tax in the state most people try to do their shopping locally. Now what we concentrate on is is a lot of service so that people know that they can come in here and, and we will work with them one-on-one -on -one versus, you know, the actual sale. You know, you don't have to worry about that quite as much. Supporting local businesses or not, driving over to New Hampshire will become an increasing trend over the next year as retail prices go up due to gas prices and consumers try to find ways to cut their costs. Jared Richardson, News 7, Littleton, New Hampshire. New Hampshire is only one of five states that is, that is sales tax free. It's been five days since Mary Pat O'Hagan went missing from her home in Sheffield. And today, federal investigators joined in the search. News 7's Jared Richardson reports. Around a dozen police vehicles, along with the Vermont State Police Mobile Command Center and the FBI, gathered at the Sheffield Municipal Building today, hoping that they could find more clues on the whereabouts of 78-year-old Mary Pat O'Hagan. The basic uh, assistance that we gained from the FBI, uh, we work closely with them on other investigations uh, throughout the year in this state. They, they have a vast um, array of technology that is at our disposal. 
and uh, we'll tap into that uh, when necessary. State police, FBI, and Vermont detectives continued their search around Sheffield and expanded their search to surrounding towns. This has included searches within the village of Sheffield, outside of the village, and has expanded beyond six miles from the center of town. Fields, woods, roadways, abandoned buildings, and vehicles have been searched. O'Hagan was reported missing on Saturday after she didn't show up to an appointment earlier that morning. State police confirmed yesterday that O'Hagan was possibly abducted. Search teams today had few details about the investigation. We continue to receive leads from the public, which we are actively following up. State police are also utilizing Vermont Fish and Wildlife and the Vermont National Guard for air support. With weather permitting, an aerial search is scheduled for tomorrow. They are telling everyone in and around Sheffield to stay cautious. We remind the citizens that they should take every precaution to lock their homes and their vehicles. Meanwhile, O'Hagan's family is still pleading for the public's help. Continue the appeal, you know, uh, understanding what my mom did, where she was. If people, you know, didn't expect to see her somewhere that she normally goes, call. If, you know, if you, if you saw her somewhere that was unexpected, call, you know, because any little bit of information is going to help. State police have been stressing during the whole investigation that help from the public is crucial. They also say that Sheffield residents should expect a heavy police presence in the coming days. Jared Richardson, News 7, Sheffield. High Street in Bradford Thursday afternoon, but yesterday the house was occupied by a fugitive from justice. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. It seems though there was, all, there was state police, there was a uh, town, a U.S. Marshal, and game warden, and... There's quite a few people around. The Stevers lived right across from the abandoned house and had no clue what was going on. Called my husband, who was home alone, and said, something's happening on our street and you need to lock the door and stay inside and be safe. 39-year-old Sean McGurk was wanted for the past two weeks after he stole two trucks in Enfield, New Hampshire, and led police on a car chase after stealing a U-Haul van. McGurk crashed the U-Haul van in Haverhill, New Hampshire, and escaped from the scene. But yesterday, Vermont State Police got a big lead in the case. Through investigative leads, we were able to determine that uh, McGurk may be uh, held up at a residence on 174 High Street in Bradford. I said, when, where is he? And he said, in the burned-out house. I said, that's next door to my house. Along. Along with the Vermont State Police, the Tactical Support Unit, the Hostage Negotiation Unit, and U.S. Marshals went to the abandoned residence on High Street in the early afternoon. Efforts to get McGurk out of the house were unsuccessful and a standoff occurred. The tactical team fired several rounds of tear gas into the residence but didn't work. Uh, the uh, chemical agent uh, did not produce any acknowledgement that he was inside the residence so the tactical support team uh, entered the residence. Police took him into custody around 5 o'clock in the evening. Once inside, they were able to, they located uh, McGurk inside of a hidden wall. The whole event was something that Peg Brown normally doesn't see every day in Bradford. No, no, no. That was enough excitement for a while. Yeah. Very much enough excitement. Yeah. McGurk is being tried for on a number of charges in New Hampshire, including burglary and reckless operations. He's also being tried for on a number of charges in Vermont, including careless and negligent operations and attempting to elude. He's being held at the Northeast Regional Correctional Facility in St. Johnsbury on $75,000 bail. Jared Richardson, News 7, Bradford. Good evening, I'm Jared Richardson. And I'm Dan Hollis. With Vermont still reeling from the effects of the national recession, the Vermont Food Bank and its partners met today in Fairly to discuss the issues that they face, from loss in donations to increases in demand. And as News 7 video journalist Chris Shadrock reports, the fifth annual Hunger Conference attracted not only Vermont's Governor Peter Shumlin, but also the Undersecretary for the Department of Agriculture. At the age of 17, some people are getting excited to graduate high school and ship off to colleges around the United States. As the year winds down, some may be scrambling to make sure everything is set for graduation. In the middle of all that commotion, one St. Johnsbury Academy student managed to write a novel. News 7's Nick Merlot reports. Some snow, especially to our south, on, on Saturday, so maybe a little bit of an April Fool's Day joke coming up by the weekend. Oh, that's crazy. We need to crack that 50-degree mark. Maybe by... <laughs> 
A couple of weeks, yeah. I can promise. But right now, it looks like we're going to be in a cold pattern for at least the next week or two. And with all the severe weather and the forecast, Lindenville is issuing a parking ban. Lindenville Police Chief Jack Harris sent out a public notice earlier today to announce that officials will be clearing all village streets tonight. This precaution is to save drivers from having to pay large fees. All vehicles should be removed from the streets before midnight. Any vehicles left on the street after midnight will be ticketed and towed. High school dropout rates in the Northeast Kingdom are relatively low, but are in line or a little bit above Vermont's average. New 7's Nadine Grimley took a deeper look into these numbers. And with town meeting day tomorrow, towns all over the area are finishing up final preparations. New 7's Lindsay Perfeno is live at the St. Johnsbury School. Lindsay, how are town officials there preparing for tonight's final budget meeting before voting begins tomorrow? New data is in concerning housing and wage information for the state of Vermont, but as the numbers are crunched, how does the Northeast Kingdom compare to the rest of the state? New 7's Garrett Combs reports.